Hey guys, it's Jay, and what I have for you today is the new Sony ZV-E1, as you can see here. Basically what we have is a high quality full frame version of the Sony ZV-E10, which is a content creating style camera optimized for ease of use. Sony sent me this camera early to play with for about a week and I really appreciate that opportunity so I can share my perspective with you guys. However, just so you know, this is a pre-production model and I was told that a firmware update is coming sometime around in June that will add more video frame rates such as 4K 120 and HD 240. All right guys, so I just wanna break down some of these new features that the Sony ZV-E1 has that stood out to me, in particular, uh, for ease of use purposes. These new features made the camera so easy to use that you don't have to know the advanced techniques required to use a camera, like for example, the FX3. Uh, it's a pretty complicated camera, extremely powerful. This is a very similar camera as far as power goes, but it's way easier to use. So let's just get right into it. Starting off with the sensor, what we got is a 12.1 megapixel full frame CMOS Exmor R sensor, which appears to be the same exact one that's in the FX3 and the A7S3. This means it's a low light monster having a maximum ISO of 409,600. This sensor also has very little rolling shutter due to the lower resolution and super fast readout speeds when compared to the Sony ZV-E10, for example. It also has dual sensitivity of ISO 640 and 12,800, which is fantastic for those low light shooters out there needing those higher ISO levels. So this is at ISO 12,800. Now, because this sensor is so large being full frame, you can easily get killer background blur and separation from your subjects, especially when using a fast aperture lens. This is what I'm talking about. I'm using the 55 millimeter F1.8 Zeiss lens and killer results with a lens like this, as you can see. All right, guys, so now I'm using the 85 millimeter F1.8 lens. And again, just look at how blurry the background is. So full frame sensor, fast aperture lens, the more telephoto the lens, the more blurry the background is gonna be, assuming you are fairly close to your subject. So again, I just wanted to show you what an 85 looks like compared to the 55. So when it comes to taking photos, the lower resolution sensor still has enough megapixels to capture detailed shots, but you won't have as much resolution to play with for huge prints or large crops, you know? So also when it comes to taking photos, the ZV-E1 does not have a mechanical shutter, but due to the fast sensor readout speed, you can still get great shots even with moving subjects, as long as they're not moving crazy fast. You know, like somebody swinging a baseball bat, that's gonna look a little distorted. The camera body has a dust and moisture resistant design. There are also several recording formats offering different compression and bit rates depending on your needs. But I've been using the XAVC HS4K at 422 10 bit 100 for the most part when I'm, you're looking at the testing footage that I have here. So this camera also has a new intelligent three capsule mic. Now the background defocus feature is amazing, especially with a full frame sensor. So watch when I hit the background defocus feature. You see that? So now the background's blurry. Normally what I would have to do is I'd have to lower the aperture to like f1.8 or something like that. But as you could see here, the camera did that for me. Now if I hit the button again, it'll make the background more sharp, as you can see. And if I wanna disable this feature altogether, I can just hit the menu button. We also have product showcase product no product product <laughs> no product i love this feature it's so easy on the other sony cameras you just have to turn facial recognition on and off to do this but it's cool just having that one button check out these empanadas so the only downside to these empanadas is they're so delicious they're like juicy so when you bite into them sometimes juice squirts out so you can see here just how crispy and delicious they look. Now watch this. Look at how blurry it is in the background. That's what you get with the full frame sensor and a fast aperture lens. Now there's also a dedicated AI chip like the new A7R5 has in this camera, which allows for some amazing new technology. Next, we have this new AI controlled auto framing, which is next level. All right, so this is what 20 millimeter looks like. Now, watch this auto framing feature. You guys aren't gonna believe this. Check this out. All right, so now I have the auto framing feature on and you can see how it's zooming in on me. So it almost looks like I'm the 55 millimeter lens now, but watch this. It's just gonna follow me. <laughs> I could go over here. 
I can go over here. I'm seeing the whole screen, what I'm seeing, like an uncropped version, and it's showing me the rectangle of what's actually being cropped. So I could see the rectangle moving as I move. You know, it's going left and right on the LCD screen here. Second cameraman, here we come, Sony ZV E1. In addition to that, we have framing stabilizer, which is very similar. All right, check this out. You see what I mean? Watch this. It's only now, because I'm using the 55 millimeter lens, there's only a little bit of space for it to work. But as you can see, it looks like a cameraman. It's unbelievable. We also have dynamic stabilization mode. All right, so now I have it in dynamic stabilization mode and you can see the crop is pretty significant here. So with the 28 millimeter lens, you know, this is 28 to 60, I have it at 28. And again, this dynamic stabilization uh, looks to be working really well. So with a wider angle lens, uh, like the 20 millimeter, it's gonna be a great option. Um, but even like this, I mean, it is a tight crop, but it might work for you depending on what you're doing. All right guys, so here we are again. I'm on my way back. I got my coffee. Um, so now I'm just using active stabilization, so it's not cropped in near as much, um, but the stabilization doesn't work quite as good. So that's active. That's off, which is the same as standard. It won't let me switch to dynamic while I'm recording. All right, so once again, that is dynamic stabilization. So again, with the 20 millimeter, it's not too bad. Like it's not too tight of a crop, but with the 28, it is a little much. So you can see here, this is what we're looking at. So let's go for a little drive and I'll hold this and see how it works. All right, so if you're using this in a situation like this and you're on a bumpy road, you want some stabilization, this dynamic stabilization is incredible, as you can see. All right, so now I'm using an 85 millimeter lens and I'm just doing a static stabilization test here. I'm hand holding. Um, I have it on active stabilization mode. I also have the microphone set to rear audio now, so it should sound pretty good with me behind the camera. All right, so now I'm recording in dynamic and of course it cropped in quite a bit more. And um, we'll compare these two. We also have multi-face recognition in auto, so everybody will look sharp if you have like a group of people. So you can see if I get close, like the background's pretty blurry. Now watch what happens when I add another face to the scene. So you could see how the face initially is blurry, but the aperture is now gonna change automatically, nice and smoothly, to get both faces sharp. Now you can see this face is sharp and my face is sharp. And if I look at the aperture on the camera, it actually stopped down to F9 like automatically while recording. So you can add another face to the scene. So if we stagger these faces, so now we have three faces at three different distances. Again, if you're using intelligent auto mode, this feature is amazing. This camera also has a new touch interface, so it's gonna be way easier for people coming from smartphones used to touching the screen to do what you want. If you swipe left and right, see how those menus on the side go away? And you can just bring them right back. And you can also swipe up from the bottom to bring up the function menu. So this is like a new interface setup. And what's so cool about this is if you're in selfie mode, like in front of the camera like this, you can actually just touch the controls now. So you don't have to reach like behind the camera awkwardly trying to find, you know, whatever button it is you're looking for. You can see them on the screen right here, like all the buttons that you would need. So I really like this new interface as far as ease of use goes. Another really cool feature is this cinematic vlog settings feature. So you can, it basically sets the camera up with like cinematic settings with the push of a button offering several looks and moods, as you can see here, such as S Cine Tone. So when using this mode, it does lock the camera down to 24P and also the cinema scope crop ratio of 2.35 to one, as you can see here. You can also change the focus transition speed in this mode, but other than that, you're kind of limited as to what you can do. Now this camera also offers the new menu like the FX3 and the FX30 has. It also offers log shooting, S-Log3, S-Gamut3 Cine, and HLG. This camera also offers assignable user LUTs for turnkey log shooting. So when it comes to cost, we're looking at approximately 2200 to 2400 US for the camera body, and we're looking at 2500 to 2600 approximately with the 28 to 60 millimeter kit lens. 
So looking at just the camera body, we're about 15.8 ounces. And if we put the kit lens on there, we're looking at about 21.4 ounces. Now that's with the battery and the memory card as well. So overall, I would say the camera is very similar to my Sony a7C and the ZV-E10 as far as the camera body goes. The ergonomics are, are pretty good, but not as good as my a7 IV, in particular the grip here. Uh, the a7 IV has a, like a more pleasing ergonomic grip uh, going on there. All right, guys, so looking at the top, we have this multi-smart hot shoe here, so you can put microphones, lights, and other accessories in there. So we also have the record button here, and then we have the mode switch here, which is like a slide toggle design. In the center area, this is where that new three capsule microphone is located. And you can also, comes with this wind diffuser that slides over there. So continuing along the top, we have this little icon here, which is the sensor plane. And you would measure from that if you're doing like macro photography and things like that. Now this right here is the tally light. So if we were to hit record, this lights up red. That's what that is. So you can see it from the front of the camera as well as the top of the camera. And the screen itself lights up with the tally light as well. I'll show you more about this when we turn the camera on. So also note the strap mounts here. They got these nice strap mounts that don't make any noise. They're like solid fixed. They don't jiggle around like on some of the older cameras like my a7C for example. So over here on the right side, we have the on off toggle switch here, which is really nice. I much prefer that over the ZV-E10, which has a slide on and off switch, kind of similar to this mode switch here. It also has this power zoom lever, which is fantastic if you're using power zoom lenses, but you can also use it for the clear image zoom and digital zoom and stuff. So it actually looks like you're using a power zoom lens, which is really cool. Um, in addition, the zoom lever works in playback mode to zoom in and out of photos and stuff like that. So you can check focus, you know what I mean? It's, it's really convenient to, to use the zoom lever for that one in playback mode. In the center here, we have a shutter button, which is a two-stage button. So if you press it lightly, it'll focus. If you press it all the way, it'll take the photo uh, when in photo mode. It just focuses when you're in video mode by default. So just behind the on off switch, we have the background defocus feature. Now this is awesome for creators because if you are if you want the background blurry, you just have to hit a button and it'll just set the camera up for you. And if you want the background sharp, again, you hit the button and it'll make the background sharp and you don't have to worry about changing any other camera settings. And that's a really cool feature and it works while you're recording. Now, lastly on the top, we have this control dial here and the feedback feels really good on this dial. And by default, this is aperture. That's what it by default controls. Uh, uh, depending on what mode you're in and stuff. All right, guys, so looking at it from the side, we got a couple doors here. If we crack this door open, we can pull this door open like so, and then this one opens this way like that. So looking at it from the side, you have a SDXC UHS-2 card slot. You have the mic port. Um, you also have the USB-C port for charging, streaming as a web camera, and transferring photos and videos to your computer. On the lower end here, we have the HDMI port, and headphone port. Now, I do wish that the HDMI was a full-size HDMI, but honestly, because it's so small, um, you can have a cable plugged in there, as you can see here, and when you open the screen, you can still rotate the screen, even with an HDMI cable plugged in and, and a charging uh, cable plugged in. So you can still like manipulate the screen. Now, looking at the bottom of the camera, we have the battery door here, and it just has like a slide lever that pops open and it does not auto lock, you have to slide it over to lock it. And then there's this blue lever here to pop the battery out and put the battery in, like so. And it's got a little extra door here if you're using a dummy battery, so you can peel this little door back and have the cable come out if you're using a dummy battery. And then of course you have the quarter inch thread here for mounting tripod plates and things like that. Moving on to the back of the camera, we have the standard three inch flippy screen now. And this is the same screen, I believe, that's on the a7 IV. So it's about a million dots and uh, it does the job well. I like how you can close it in armored mode like this, which is quite nice when you're storing the camera. Of course, you can have it the other way as well if you want the screen on the back. But like I said, when I put the camera away, I always have it in armor mode. Now you got a bunch of buttons over here. You got a zoom button, the function menu button. You have a control wheel that turns like so. And then it also acts as a four-way button. So you got up, you know, left, right, display and so forth. You have the playback button to get into the menu uh, to view your photos and videos and stuff. Now down here is the garbage can, which is actually the product showcase button. And it works as a garbage can if in playback mode, it'll you could delete photos and stuff. And then if you're in the menu system and you hit the garbage can, it'll actually uh, bring up a description of what that feature is. 
All right, so when you first boot the camera up, this is what you're presented with. You just have to select your language. And now it's saying, uh, when shooting from a tripod instead of shooting while holding the device, setting the auto power off temp to high. So yes, let's set that now. And we do want to set it to high. And it's just letting you know that the camera might get hotter than you might expect. And there you have it. So now it's telling us here that you can swipe left and right and up and down to bring out the new touch menus. All right, guys, so I have the camera set to video mode right here, and this is what the screen looks like in video mode. But watch when I change it to photography mode. This screen is going to change. You see how it changed? So now we have like a shutter button here as opposed to a record button. We actually have the record button too, but there's also that circle there, which stands for, you know, a shutter button. So now if I go all the way to the right to S and Q mode, you have intelligent auto right here. It tells you it automatically identifies the scene and it'll shoot a slow or quick motion movie. And you can select your settings there. It also does time lapse here. So you have automatic time lapse as well. Now you can set these settings manually, but it's just cool that this is built in and it has like an auto setting for you. So if you just want to capture a really quick time lapse or something like that, you could just go right to auto, boom, you're good to go. Again, this thing is optimized for ease of use. So let me put it back in video mode here and just go around the screen just a little bit to show you what some of this stuff is. So on the top left, that is your mode. So if you click it, you could just touch and now you can change your shoot mode. So by default, it's an intelligent auto. So I'm just going to leave it there. But if you scroll down, you can see the other modes like you would normally expect. Program auto, aperture priority, shutter priority, manual, memory recall. So I'm just going to put it back in intelligent auto though for now. And again, scrolling around, you got a self timer here for video. This is where your mic options are, this little mic icon here. Then you have Cine Vlog off. That's where the camera will turn basically into like a cinema style look where you can you can go in here. Now I just touch the screen. So so if you touch the screen, it will enable tracking by default and to disable tracking. Look, I'll touch. So you could either hit this little cancel button there on the top. You see that little square. You can hit that to cancel tracking or you can hit this center button here to cancel tracking. So sometimes when you try to hit these buttons, you might enable tracking and uh, you need to know that because you don't want it to necessarily be tracking something in the corner. You see how it says on and now you have these little sub menu items. So you can go in here and you can change the brightness of the scene. You can just slide the slider. You can change the temperature of the scene. You can just slide the slider and this stuff works while you're recording. I can go into the uh, custom settings and I could make this the, the scene brighter or darker just by sliding left and right, as you can see here. I can also change the color temperature by going here. I can make it warmer or cooler. I'm just going to hit the menu button to go back. And I'm going to turn that off. And now up here you have the record button. If I hit that, you could see it's recording. And now I have that red box around the screen letting you know that it's recording as well as the tally light up here. Letting you know it's recording and just hit that to stop recording. Now you have the product showcase option right here, which is also the garbage can button. You could see the little icon here is the same as the icon there. And over here you have subject detection or recognition. So right now it's set to birds and these buttons here, some of them like this one in particular acts as like a, a toggle. So you just are cycling through each time you press it as you can see, and now I'm back to human. Now zoom will automatically zoom in for you. If you press this, you can select what kind of zoom option you want. So you could either use the zoom lever or you can just click like 1.5 or something like that and it'll zoom in for you. And then again, you have a shortcut and if I just hit the X, it'll cancel that out, the little X next to the zoom there. So then you have playback, which is the same as hitting the playback button. That'll bring you into that menu. So let me just show you the vlog really quick. If I click the vlog option, by default, it's set to S Cinetone and auto, but you can change that. If you click on S Cinetone here, you can switch between S Cinetone. You can go over to clean, chick, fresh, and mono, and you can also change the look. You can't do it in mono. So let me go back to S Cinetone here. And instead of auto, we're going to change that. And you can change it to gold, ocean, and so forth. I'm using S Cinetone, but this time I'm using it in the gold like variety. So you can change the way the S Cine Tone looks, it has a couple different options. Let me show you. Here's the ocean version. So this is what the ocean looks like. And then you got a forest version, which adds like a green, kind of like a green cast to it. So this is the forest version. Let me just go back to the original here. 
All right, so now this is S Cine Tone Auto, which I think looks really good, just as is. Looks pretty good. I'm just gonna hit the X there to X out of that, and I'm gonna turn Cine Vlog off. So now it says off there, see how it says off? All right, so now if I swipe up from the bottom, this is the function menu. And some of these features are the same features that were in on the side, but here it gives you like more power. For example, if I hit the microphone, instead of just toggling through the different mic options, here you can actually go through and select which one you want. So you can select front, all directions, back, and then just click OK. But watch when I hit it up here. When I press it up here, it's just cycling through the options, you see? So you don't get that other menu when you're doing it from these buttons. Same thing with the facial. So if I click the facial one, see now how I have the option on the side and you can just scroll through all the different options quickly. When you click it from up here, you actually have to cycle through, you know? All right, so looking around this menu here, because I'm in full auto, the options on the left are grayed out. Um, but one of them is picture profiles and the other one is white balance. So if you go to a more powerful mode like program auto, for example, those features will ungray and you'll be able to see them a little better. Um, but what I wanted to show you here was the stabilization one. You see how it says active right there? If I click on that icon, these are the stabilization modes. Now this new one here is called dynamic active. Standard, there's like no crop. That's just gonna use the optical stabilization of the lens and the five axis stabilization sensor rig. So that will be the full frame when you're in standard mode or off, just so you're aware. Now, if I just go back here, I'll just click okay, swipe up. All right guys, so as awesome as the dynamic stabilizer is, it crops in quite a bit. So if you wanna get like butter smooth stabilization while you're walking with zero crop, this is where a gimbal would come in. Now this is the DJI RS3 Mini and it's pretty much the perfect solution for the ZV-E1 because it's such a small camera and the gimbal itself is very lightweight. I created a highly detailed tutorial on how to use this gimbal, by the way, with the Sony a7 IV, and it's gonna work the same way with the Sony ZV-E1. Over here on the right is skin smoothing, or soft skin effect is what Sony calls it. So by default, it's on medium. I'm actually gonna shut that off. I don't really like it. So I have the skin smoothing right now set to high. So you could see on my face, it probably looks, you know, like almost like I have makeup on or something. This is with skin smoothing off, just for reference. So another really cool feature is this option here. It looks like a little rectangle. It's called framing stabilizer. So this option here is for touch function. So you can control what like touch does. Now by default, it is touch tracking and that's what this icon means. So now this icon means touch focus. So if you touch around the screen, it'll just focus on that area, but it won't track that subject. And if you scroll, you have other options here like this one, AE. This stands for touch auto exposure. And this is new from what I've seen. I don't recall ever seeing this on a Sony camera. So basically you just touch around the screen and then you can dial in the exposure by sliding the bar left and right. It's particularly useful if you're trying to zoom in on like a cell phone screen or like a TV screen or something, and it's fairly small in the total frame. And you can also have it connected with tracking. You see how you have a on there. I have it set to off by default, but you can tie those two options together if you want, and it'll auto expose on what it's tracking, which is very helpful if the subject is going into really bright conditions and then dark conditions, the auto exposure will fluctuate on that object. All right, so this new menu, you can actually just touch around if you want to select, and because I'm in Intelligent Auto, I can't change that feature. These are all like the key features that you would need for video. That's what we're looking at here. So by default, it is set to 60p HD. So I'm gonna set this to 4K, because that's what I like to use. I'm gonna set it to the 4K HS option. And then I'm gonna go up here and I'm gonna set it to 24p, like so. And then down here, I'm gonna select the Record setting. Now I'm gonna use 10-bit 422. Um, that's the quality that I'm gonna go with. It'll really give you some good quality footage. That's how I like having it set. Now if you scroll down, 
this is like the second page of this new menu. This is where log shooting is. Now, if you're not familiar with what log is, it basically will record more information and you'll get more dynamic range, but it does require some kind of post-processing after the fact, except for the fact that you can load LUTs onto this camera and basically the camera will do the work for you and export the footage like fully graded. All right, so in here under zoom, this is where you can control your zoom lever speed and the step magnification amount if you're using this button over here, the zoom button. You can actually change if you're using a remote, the zoom speed of a remote. Shooting options in here, we have a couple of these new awesome features that I wanna show you. You got product showcase. Now the background defocus feature, you can actually control how much it defocuses. So I have it set to like maximum. I want it to go out of focus as much as possible. All right guys, now auto framing settings. If you go in here, this is where you can adjust the settings for this particular feature. All different options, you got on, off of course. Then you can change how it starts. So you can have it start in like 15 seconds. You can have it start when you hit the tracking button or you can just have it auto start for you, which is what it's set to by default. And you can also change how much it zooms in on you. So if you want a really tight crop, you can go to large crop level, medium crop level, small crop level. I'm gonna set it to large crop level and you can change the tracking speed as well. So if you like move quickly, it'll take a second for the camera to catch up like a real cameraman. And you can actually change the speed of that. You can change the way that this exports as well. Like if you're uh, streaming, for example, or if you're recording externally via the HDMI, you can change those options as well by having it not crop or crop. Now I wanted to show you this stuff because it's very important when you're trying to get more dramatic transitions. And this is the autofocus transition speed. So by default, it is set to seven. I would recommend slowing that down to like, I don't know, five, something like that. It looks a little more cinematic when it's going just a little bit slower. Now, if you're using faster frame rates, however, you might wanna speed that back up because when you're using like 60p, for example, if you're gonna slow that footage down, the slower transition speed might actually take too long and kind of look weird. So face memory, this is where you can actually program faces into the camera and then you can prioritize those faces. So if you're shooting sports or your kid's in a play or whatever the case may be, you can take a picture of your kid or whoever you're tracking and you could prioritize their face. So if there's like a group of kids, the camera will focus on the face that it's looking for. All right, so in here is where your streaming options would be. And this camera will just work as like a webcam if you plug it in to the USB port. Now here is where you can save and load settings. So if you have the camera set up, you can actually save the settings uh, to a memory card and then you could bring the memory card into another camera and then load them. So if you had like multiple of these, you would only need to set up one camera and then you can save the settings and then bring the memory card and just load up all the cameras with those settings. This is the customize area. Now you can go in here and customize this camera to a really high level. As you can see here, custom key set if you go in there, this is what's showing you what you can do. And it's just incredibly powerful how many things you can change on this camera. If you want to change buttons around and stuff, this is where you would go to do that. Now function menu settings, you have a function menu for photos and a function menu for video. And you can customize these however you want. That one feature I was telling you about earlier called auto framing, I was thinking about adding that into the video menu here instead of soft skin effect, because I don't really use that anyway. So I'm gonna add the auto framing feature in here. Auto framing, there we go. So now we have auto framing in there and we have the frame stabilizer. So we got both those features in the function menu. So now if I swipe up, you see how I have the auto framing feature there? So I just customized my function menu and now I have that feature in there so I don't have to dig down in the menu to find it. Now different set for still and movie. If you go in here, this is where you can click OK. So what this means is if you have all these options selected, when you switch from photo to video, uh, like using the switch here, if you have the camera set to like F4, for example, at a certain shutter speed, and then you switch it to video mode, those settings will stay. So you might not want that. If you want completely independent settings for photo and video, you want to enable all this stuff. And I have this stuff enabled on mine. This is how I have it set on my a7 IV as well. So if I switch from photo to video mode, I have completely independent settings. 
screen reader. This is for people that are like visually impaired. You can actually have the camera will read the screen to you. Monitor brightness is one thing that I definitely wanted to show you here. Because there's no viewfinder on this camera, it can be really hard to see the screen in bright conditions. So if you go in here and just hit the center button, you can actually select sunny weather. And notice how much brighter the screen just got. That's sunny weather, and it makes it way easier to see outside in the sun. So I wanted to make sure you guys knew about that. Now monitor flip direction. Some people don't like when it looks mirrored, and this is where you can go to change that. All right, so the last thing I wanna show you, just in case you didn't set it up when you first turned the camera on, is the auto power off temp. Highly recommend putting that to high, and that'll allow you to record for a really long time. So who is this camera for? In my opinion, this camera is for content creators on the move wanting the best possible quality and ease of use. And I can't emphasize ease of use enough. This camera is also a low light monster. So people working in low light situations will see a huge benefit when compared to the smaller sensor ZV cameras, you know, like the ZV-E10 or the ZV-1, for example. The dynamic stabilization option, new feature, pretty amazing. Uh, but it does require a big crop. So you are really gonna need a wide angle lens if using that mode, in my opinion, especially in selfie. If you're far enough away from the camera, the, the kit lens or a regular lens will be fine. But if you're hand holding, talking to the camera, and you wanna use that dynamic stabilization, you are gonna need a wide lens. Uh, I used a 20 millimeter and that was pretty much wide enough uh, for that feature in my opinion. All right guys, so the framing stabilizer feature is really cool, uh, especially if you're filming yourself. It just crops in on you and you could like walk around. Now the auto framing feature does the same thing, but it's like the next level of power where it'll actually zoom in and out and follow you around using the AI. Again, just incredible for creators like filming yourself if you wanted to like track you around the room or whatever. So the product showcase feature in effect shuts off facial recognition and is awesome for showing off products. But it's worth noting that it does not work while recording. You have to like enable it and disable it and then hit record just so you guys are aware. And you definitely do want to disable it uh, if you're not using it, because if you put your hands up or something, it's going to focus on the hands. Now, the background defocus is another awesome feature because you don't need to mess with the aperture controls or anything like that. You can just hit a button and the background will go blurry or the background will go sharp, depending. And you can do that while recording. So you don't have to stop recording to enable and disable that. The new screen user interface is awesome and it's set up so much more for touch. People coming from smartphones and not necessarily hardcore camera users are going to love that because you could just touch the buttons on the screen. And like I said, when you're in selfie mode, having to reach around the back of the camera to change settings and stuff like sucks. So now you can just point around on the screen. Now for the long form filmmakers, you might be better off going with something like the FX3 because that has active cooling. Now that camera is significantly more money, but the active cooling and built-in cage might be something for long form recording. Like I'm talking like hours of recording. Now, I, like I said, this thing, I didn't have a problem with the overheating once I sent the temperature to high. Before I set the temperature to high, um, it did overheat. It stopped recording in like 30 minutes or so when I was recording 4K 60. But once I set it to high, no problem. All right, guys, that about wraps up the Sony ZV-E1 first impressions video here. And I really hope you guys got what you were looking for. I really appreciate you checking out the video. Do me a favor, please hit that subscribe button and uh, that thumbs up if you don't mind, if you found this video Video useful. I really appreciate that. And uh, I will be coming out with more videos for the ZV-E1. I plan on making a full, highly detailed beginner's guide as soon as possible, but I want to wait for a production model. And as I mentioned earlier, I want to make a dedicated video on the Creators app as well, and uh, possibly some other videos on just various features and use cases, things like that. So, all right, guys, I will catch up with you next time. Have a good one.